Good afternoon, welcome all of you. Thank you very much for coming. It's, uh, it's quite an achievement. Of course, it's when well belonging to the name that brings so many people at this time of year, which is quite unusual. Um, just on a, on a personal note, um, I had started something with the day in the 1980s. And I had read the translation of Hindu myths and of the Rig Veda by somebody whose name, for reasons peculiar to me only, was uh, Wendy Doniger or Flat. And at one point in the late 1980s, I started visiting Chicago, where I went, where I met actually Wendy Doniger, whom I found even more fascinating than I had expected Wendy Doniger or Flaherty uh, to be. Fascinating and intriguing. We got on very well. We met in other places. She very graciously introduced me to Mary Douglas in London. We drank gin and tonic because she was drinking vodka at the time, as she always does, as she always does. Um, uh, but I mean, my own personal sentiments apart, uh, Wendy Doniger is far more interesting, uh, and her scholarship is more interesting than I, what I, I might have to say about her. Um, I shall not list her honorary doctorates, I shall not speak about her positions, I will not list her books. Um, I will mention only two, uh, Shiva, uh, the erotic ascetic, uh, and her latest offering to all of us, the Hindus, an alternative history. Now, what is especially salient for me is when the Donovan's combination of exact theological scholarship and Sanskrit and other languages, and the love of her material, especially stories with which she regains herself and her readers, as befits an ecologist and the father of her, who in another time might have taken an altogether different career path than that of scholarship. Now, if an ultimate proof were to be required that scholarship need not necessarily be done, and can indeed be very far from being done, it is where we done it. Living proof provided by a scholar who uses a well-practiced theological understanding and well-practiced senses, including an acute consciousness of the body and its capillaries, that only a, a former ballerina will be able to command now come to maturity and convey to all of us uh, here. When the Donigers practice theological understanding and their sensibilities overall are by no means confined to Indian materials. Her engagement with Greek myth, with Greek tragedy, is an abiding feature of her heart overall, and indeed of her life. In all cases, we read in Wendy Donigers' work of myth, of bodily fluids, of violence, of color, of truth, untruth, and masquerade, of joy and chagrin, all grist of the mill, of such an acute sensibility, and of such a broad comparative reach in the history of religion, all practiced with exemplary engagement. But the cosmic dance of Shiva, the circles of the Shaka, are by no means matters that would bring her work full sun. Not long ago, when the Dominica delivered a university publication address entitled Thinking More Critically About Thinking Too Critically. <laughs> Sweet music to my ears, I must say. She proposed that the postures of the postmodern hermeneutic of suspicion should give way to a hermeneutic of the truth and argued against the aridity of relativism and other matters of postmodern besser viser. It comes as no surprise that the latest book has been strangely attacked at the instigation of international Hindu associations and related bodies. After all, she sought to retrieve the new experience of Hinduism. Social no less than psychic, contra the sanitization of religion so vehemently asserted with proprietorial claims by her detractors, speaking for the primacy of the proved self-representation for identity and relativism as propounded by these organizations and by quite a number of Oxford educated fakirs, many of which you know. An apologetic Hinduism that is primarily foundation, ecumenical, direct of unreason, of myth, of bustle, of animalism, of power, and of dirt. This is not the Hinduism that went to Donega with recognize. Not one that any sensible person might recognize. It is now, of course, up to Wendy Doniger to help us recognize matters that might have escaped us. My anticipation is Thank you very much. It's often to sit next to someone who's saying things like that, but I'm going to there and talk.
hide my face. <laughs> thank you very much um, for such a generous introduction. And thank you all for coming up. I'm very finals week when you have many important things to do. But I'm going to talk about a subject I care about, as I always do, and I'll uh, leave time for discussion. Um, I, I, I always go on working on the subject. I wish I'm the book is finished, but the thing is always continue. So I like, I'm still working on this, and I'd like to hear what you think. So my topic is dogs as Dalits and dogs with Dalits in the history of Hinduism. And the broader subject, which is the one that I raised in the last book, to which Aziz alluded, how does one go about telling the story of the Hindus by including the maverick as well as the mainstream Hindus in the story? And of course, the mainstream Hindus are the ones who objected to the prominence that prominence I give to the mavericks in my book. The Brahmins, the highest class, the class of priests and scribes, produced a great literature, but they didn't produce it in a vacuum. They did not have complete authority or control the minds of everyone in India. They grew upon, on the one hand, the people around the country, the political actors, and on the other hand, the non-literate classes who had a great culture but simply did not read or write it. They spoke it. The ancient Sanskrit texts, usually dismissed as the word work of Brahmin males, in fact reveal a great deal about the lower castes. The people now generally called Dalits, who used to be called untouchables, I prefer to call them pariahs because that's actually a Tamil word that gets into English. So it's both a native word in English and a native word in, um, in Indian languages. The British imported it into English. So these are the people. Uh, the Dalits, otherwise known as the Tashkans, otherwise known as Purahas. Because of the presence of oral and folk traditions in Sanskrit texts, and that's the tip of a long iceberg argument, which is basically that Brahmins who spoke Sanskrit never spoke only Sanskrit. They all had to be bilingual. They all had to speak some other language to their wives, to their servants, to the people. And it was no one in India except the Brahmins spoke Sanskrit. And they were not an isolated community. So the Sanskrit text had to be composed by people who had access to other literatures. And that's how the Dalit voices get into Sanskrit literature. Therefore, the lower castes do speak in Sanskrit texts, not always in voices recorded on a page, but in signs that we can read if we try. And we, in that way, I want to argue that there have been protests against the mistreatment of the lower castes from a very early age in India, though these protests generally took the form of renouncing caste society and forming an alternative society in which caste was ignored. In early times Buddhism, later on some of the Bhakti movements. No actual reforms <coughs> took place until the 19th century. No actual tried to get casteism out of India. They tried to form alternate worlds, little microcosms in which they themselves did not practice the mistreatment of the lower castes. Yet the lower castes have left their traces in upper caste literature too. That's what I really want to talk about. One way to look for this submerged information by Brahmins about non-Brahmins is in texts about dogs. More generally, animals play important roles in the Hindu religious imagination. Yogic postures, sexual positions are named after animals. Cats and herons are used as symbols of ascetic hypocrisy. Gods become incarnate as animals, and they have animal vehicles in the human world. The process works in two opposite directions at once. On the one hand, the observation of the local fauna provides images with which people may think of their gods. So people who grew up with sheep as one kind of god, people who grew up with tigers have another kind. Whether or not people get the gods that they deserve, they tend to get the gods and demons that their animals deserve. On the other hand, the ideas that people have about the nature of the gods, and about the world, and about themselves, leads them to project onto animals characteristics that someone from another culture would not see in the same animal. Clearly, the two, the animals of the mind and the animals of the terrain, are intimately connected and both are essential to our understanding of for caste-minded Hindus, dogs are as unclean as pigs are to Orthodox Jews and Muslims. 
people who work with animals, people who work with leather, people who work with corpses, people who carry out human waste, they're often called dogs. Dogs are also associated with the tribal people of India who hunt with dogs. Many of the lowest castes are actually called dog cookers, dog eaters, shawpakas, because caste Hindus thought that these people ate dogs, who of course eat anything. And in Hinduism, you are what you eat. Under the British Raj in India, signs often proclaimed no dogs or Indians allowed. But texts sympathetic to the lower caste are sometimes masked by narratives about dogs. Texts covertly critical of the caste system reverse the symbolism of dogs and speak of breaking the rules for dogs, treating them as if they were not impure. Tracing these stories through the centuries, we can see how the attitudes to the marginalized groups <coughs> represented by dogs constantly shifted. That a Brahmin who would not say something about a Dalit would say something about a dog that I think is a mass state protest, a covert, closeted protest against mistreatment of the lowest castes. The great, I will start with Mahabharata, the great Sanskrit epic, enormous text composed between 300 BCE and 300 CE, hundreds of thousands of verses. Um, generally, um, written by Brahmins, written, composed by Brahmins, and then later written down, generally uphold the basic prejudice against dogs. And there's a story I want to begin with which shows the, the baseline from which I want to move off, the, the normal, caste-oriented line. I also think it's a text that makes fairly obvious the analogy between dogs and upwardly mobile pariahs. <coughs> So this is the dog who became a lion. Once there was an ascetic of such goodness that the flesh-eating wild animals, lions, tigers, running elephants, leopards, rhinoceroses, and bears, were like his disciples. A dog was his companion, devoted, tranquil, living on roots and fruits. Mula fala, it's a phrase meaning a very holy person who is complete vegetarian and vegan, right? Living on roots and fruits. The ideal ones only eat the fruits that fall down from the tree of their own accord, so there's actually no violence to little things at all. So the dog was doing this. And the dog had a heart like that of a human being. One day a hungry leopard came there and was about to seize the dog as his prey when the dog begged the sage to save him. The sage turned him into a leopard, and then when a tiger attacked, into a tiger, and then a running elephant, and then a lion. Now that he was carnivorous, all the other animals feared the dog and stayed away. And finally, he wanted to eat the sage, who read his thoughts and turned him back into a dog. His own property, his own proper form by birth. And the word birth is jati. The dog moped about unhappily until the sage drove him out of the hermitage. That's the other story. So the dog in this story has a human heart, but is not supposed to get ideas above his station. The phrase, his own proper form by birth, jati, can also be translated, his own proper form by caste, for jati also means caste. Both the dog and the sage are all wrong from the beginning. The dog violates the dharma of a dog, dharma being a moral law. He violates it by being a vegetarian, whereas he should be a carnivore, indeed, an omnivore. And the sage is wrong, too, to protect the dog by making him bigger and bigger instead of putting him in a safer place. But the sage does not reciprocate the dog's devotion or attachment to him. Where the dog misrecognizes himself as human, the sage, in the end, is as cruel as the dog. Even when he turns the dog back into a dog, he kicks him. A very different point of view is expressed in the other big story about dogs that occurs in the Mahabharata. It occurs at the very end when Yudhishthira, the great king, who is the son of the moral law incarnate, is the son of Dharma incarnate, is walking alone to heaven. Everybody else has died. He's left alone. And the dog attaches himself to Yudhishthira. Yudhishthira walked alone, never looking down. Only a dog followed him, the dog that I've already told you about by the love, says the author. 
Then Indra, king of the gods, came to Yudhishthira in his chariot and said, Get in. Yudhishthira said, This doll, O lord of the past and the future, has been constantly devoted to me. Let him come with me, for my way of thinking is not cruel. Indra said, Today you've become immortal like me, and you've won heaven. Leave the doll. There's nothing cruel in that. There's no place for dog owners in the world of heaven, for evil spirits carry off anything that's been sacrificed if it's left uncovered and a dog even looks at it. Therefore, you must leave this dog, and by leaving the dog, you'll win the world of the gods. Yudhishthira said, people say that abandoning someone devoted to you is a bottomless evil, equal to killing a Brahmin, and in this text by Brahmins, killing a Brahmin is the very worst thing you can do. I think so too, says Yudhishthira. When the god Dharma, who had been there in the form of the dog, heard these words, he appeared in his own form and spoke to Yudhishthira with affection, saying, Great king, you weep with all creatures. The word for compassion in Sanskrit, anukroshana, weeping along with compassion. You weep with all creatures. Because you turned down the celestial chariot by insisting this dog is devoted to me, there is no one your equal in heaven, and you will go to heaven with your own body. And he does. That's the end of that chapter. So what I find most striking is that the god of Dharma himself becomes incarnate in a doll. It is as if the god of the Hebrew Bible became incarnate in a pig. Clearly, animals are being used here as usual to make a powerful ethical point. It is a way of arguing about the sorts of humans who should or should not go to heaven, a topic that the Mahabharata also explicitly addresses. And I think by extension, it's about the castes who should or should not be allowed into temples, which is considered to this day as a very important, uh, much debated point. Uh, just a few years ago, a man of low, low caste was beaten to death for going into a temple that low castes were not supposed to go in. So I think that's one of the things the story is about. All good Hindus go to heaven, but they do so after dying and being given a different heavenly body. Yudhishthira is unique in being given the gift of going to heaven in his own body. Perhaps in acknowledging his bond with animals, treating a dog like someone who has come to you for refuge or a friend, Yudhishthira has preserved the animality of his own body the very animality denied by sages who regard dogs as dirty. And he enters heaven not merely as a disembodied spirit, but as his entire self. He refuses to abandon a dog who is devoted to him, and the word for devoted is bhakta. The dog, the loyal dog, is after all the natural devotee of the human kingdom. It's no accident that it's a dog and not a cat who is devoted to him. But bhakti, devotion, at this period meant little more than belonging to someone like a servant or a friend or a worshiper. It would be a Shiva bhakta or a Vishnu bhakta, a devotee of Shiva or of uh, Vishnu. It didn't yet have the meaning it took on later, especially in South India, of a passionate devotion to a god which blots out everything else in your life. As the word expanded its meaning, however, the story of Yudhishthira and his dog came to be reread in retrospect as a model for that kind of devotion, for extreme of bhakti. In the story, the conflict remains unresolved. The text equivocates. It's very unusual for the author to speak in the first person as he does in this passage, the dog that I already told you about a lot. I think that it means that the author suddenly breaks into the story to anticipate the fact that it is just a story that is about to come to an end, you just took those to heaven, that's the end of the Mahabharata. And he reminds the audience that it is only a story, and indeed only a magical test, one of a series of tests that Hindu Yudhishthira is subjected to. In other words, no doll ever goes to heaven. There is no doll. They don't have to violate the law of caste. It was all an illusion. The story brings yourself to brings itself to the point of kind of moral breakthrough. It's okay for no to heaven. And then it, 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 it chickens out. It says actually it wasn't really a dog, it was just a god, in the form of a dog, you dish your goes 
to heaven, the dog vanishes. And it never becomes a point. The story shows just how rotten the caste system is, but doesn't change it. No dogs actually go to heaven. I want to skip forward several hundred years to a new set of texts, also Sanskrit texts, also recorded by Brahmins, Brahmins in conversation with uh, other castes, in which the position of dogs has radically changed. And things that the Mahabharata could begin to think about but not do anything about can now happen. Um, there's a series of stories. This is a text from the 9th and 10th century. An evil thief was killed by the king's men. A dog came to eat him, and accidentally, unthinkingly, the dog's nails made the mark of Shiva's trident on the man's forehead. So worshippers of Shiva wore three stripes on their forehead like this. So the idea is that the dog takes his nails, scratches the man, and makes the sign of Shiva. Unthinkingly, obviously didn't know what he was doing. The text says, without consciousness, I checked him. As a result, Shiva's messengers took the man to Kalasa, to heaven, to, to Shiva's heaven. So this dog performs an accidental act of worship with the lowest part of his body, his foot. He intends to eat the thief, and as far as I know, he does eat the thief. We never find out what happens to the thief's body after this. Um, but he blesses the thief by doing this, and it's because of the dog's foot that a man who's lived a life of unrepentant sin goes to heaven when he dies. There's another more complicated story about accidental grace in uh, a story from South India, the same rough period. Once upon a time, there was a certain tribal, a man of cruel addictions. He killed fish and animals and birds and even robins. And his wife was just like him. One day, the night of Shiva occurred. The night of Shiva, Shiva Rathri, is a holy day in India in which you're supposed to stay awake all night, you're supposed to fast, and you're supposed to offer food to poor people. So this is Shiva Rathri. And you're also supposed to decorate images of Shiva with a special kind of leaf, or the Bilwa leaf. It comes from a particular tree that's sacred to Shiva. That you need to know. Okay, back to Shiva. So one night, on the great night of Shiva, the hunters spent the night in a bilwa tree, wide awake, hoping to kill a wild <coughs> boar. There happened to be a statue of Shiva under the tree. The leaves of the bilwa tree that the hunter cut off to get a better view accidentally fell on the statue of Shiva. And so unknowingly, he performed an act of worship. His wife, too, stayed up all night worrying about him, because she feared he had been killed. But she went and found him and brought him food. And while they were bathing before their meal, a dog came and ate all the food. She became angry and started to kill the dog. But the hunter said, it gives me great satisfaction to know that the dog has eaten the food. What use is this body anyway? Don't be angry. And so he enlightened her. Shiva sent his messengers with a heavenly chariot to take the tribal to the world of Shiva with his wife because he had worshipped the statue of Shiva on the night of Shiva. But the tribal said, I am a violent hunter, a sinner. How can I go to heaven? How did I worship Shiva? And they told him how he had cut the leaf and had fasted and had stayed up all night and had fed someone. And so he went to heaven. So by eating the food, the dog inadvertently causes the tribal and his wife to give food, also inadvertently a part of the worship prescribed for the night of Shiva. So this story depicts inadvertent worship by someone who violates Hindu Dharma by killing animals and is nevertheless <coughs> saved by being touched by a dog. And the third story in this series, these are interesting stories. As I said, people in India who do not read or write very often are enormously literate in the sense that they know all the stories. So the author of these later stories knows all the ones that come before. So he's really expanding on it, changing the moral universe a little bit by retelling the kind of story that people by this time know, the story of the dog accidentally sending a man to heaven. It's no longer a new idea, but it's developed yet further in this later text. There's a king named Veda. He's the most sinful king. He kills his mother. He performs abortions. He does terrible things. A very bad person in the Hindu view. 
And finally, when he's uh, trying to expiate his sins, he goes to purify himself at an important shrine by a river. But as he approached the shrine, the gods forbade him to bathe there. A voice said, do not do this. Protect the shrine. This man is enveloped in an evil so terrible that it would destroy the shrine. Now there was a dog there who had been a man in a previous life but had been sinful and hence we want as a dog. The dog came to the river and swam there and his impurities were shaken off and his thirst slaked. And he was hungry and entered Vena's hut. When Vena saw the dog, he was afraid. Vena touched him gently and the dog showered him with water from the shrine. In fright of the dog, Vena plunged into the water and by the power of the shrine, he was saved. Shiva came in person and offered Vena a boon. And Vena said, I plunge into the lake out of fear of this dog, for the gods forbade me to bathe here. The dog did me a favor, and so I ask you to favor him. Shiva was pleased and promised that the dog would be freed from sin and would go straight to Shiva's heaven. And he promised Vena that he too would go to Shiva's heaven for a while. So Vain is not finished yet, but the dog is. So the unclean dog transfers the water from his body to that of Vena, both by shaking himself, as wet dogs do, and by frightening Vena so that he overcomes Vena's correct observance of the prohibition against entering, for him to enter the shrine. It's a kind of Hindu catch-22. He's so sinful that he would make the shrine sinful. He's too sick. He would make the medicine sick if he took the medicine. The dog, therefore, intercedes for him, makes him a little less polluted so that he becomes eligible for real purification. It is not finished. He has other rebirths to expiate his serious sins, but the dog makes it possible for him to move forward on the path of salvation. And finally, at the end of this myth, and a millennium or two, after Yudhishthira's dog in the Mahabharata vanished before he could enter heaven, this dog enters Shiva's heaven. I want to um, move to a second set of stories about, more explicitly about low caste people but still associated with dogs. And again, trace a kind of moral progression uh, in more, uh, uh, more extreme moral progression than we can see in the case of dogs. I want to give you one um, final contemporary uh, dog story from, from contemporary India to show how far the dogs go, how far I move from the story of the tribe. This was a story carried in the Hindustan Times and CNN from New Delhi. Yeah, on November 13th, 2007. Now, we did literally. It's a short one. A man in southern India married a female dog in a traditional Hindu ceremony in a bid to atone for stoning two dogs to death, the newspaper reported Tuesday. The 33-year-old man married the sorry draped dog at a temple in the southern state of Tamil Nadu on Sunday after an astrologer said it was the only way to cure himself of a disability, the Hindu Times newspaper reported. P. Selva Kumar told the paper that he had been suffering since he stoned two dogs to death and strung them up in a tree 15 years ago. Quote, after that my legs and hands got paralyzed and I lost hearing in one ear, unquote, the paper quoted him as saying. Family members chose a stray female dog named Selvi, who was then bathed and clothed for the ceremony. The groom and his family then had a feast while the dog got a bun, the paper said. End of the story. So the special moment of compassion is balanced by a memory of more typical cruelty. A more typical modern um, dog seen in India is at the temple of the god Shiva in his form of Bhairava, who is a low caste person. The god becomes a low caste person. He wears a bell around his leg as low caste people do to warn Brahmins that they're coming so they can actually get off the path without ever even seeing them, let alone touching them. But Bhairava is Shiva and he has black dogs as his uh, companies, they're the ones on the poster. That was the, the image of uh, Shiva with his black dogs. 
And there's a temple to Bhairava, to Shiva as this low caste person in Banaras, which I visited just a year and a half ago, and it's filled with statues of dogs and real dogs who are safe there. And they're not mangy like other dogs on the streets in India. And they're fed. People bring offerings to them. They know that they're safe there. They go right up to you very boredly, whereas other dogs usually cringe in India. So there are special places where the normal world of our dogs, in which people stone them to death and strain them up, are suddenly reversed for special reasons in India. Now we move on to the tribal with his dog. This is also told originally in the Mahabharata, this great epic. Um, from the ancient period. The five princes called the Pandavas were the pupils of the martial arts teacher Drona. And of the five princes, Arjuna was the star pupil. One day, uh, a tribal person, a person of these outcast tribes named Ekalavya, came and asked the boy to teach him archery too. And Drona said, I can't possibly teach him archery. It's a sport for nobles. These are princes. Get out of here. So he kicked him out. But Ekalavya taught himself to be a great archer by building an image of Drona the teacher, doing puja to it, honoring it, and he became a great archer. One day the Pandavas, these five brothers, were out hunting with their dog. The dog wandered off and got lost. He came upon Ekalavya, the tribal, who was black, wrapped in black deer skin, hair all matted, dressed in rags, his body caked with dirt. The dog stood there barking at him until the tribal shot, shot seven arrows almost simultaneously into the dog's mouth. He shot the dog's mouth shut by putting arrows all around him. What for us, he said. The dog with his mouth full of arrows went whimpering back to the Pandava princes who expressed their admiration for the man who had accomplished this amazing feat of archery and went to find him. Then they found that he was the tribal in Colombia. Arjuna asked Rona why he had a pupil, the son of a tribal, who was an even better archer than he, Arjuna. Then Rona went to Ekalavya and said, if you are my pupil, pay me my fee right now. And in India, you don't pay for matriculation until you finish the course. And then you give the guru a present or the guru dachshund. So Rona said, if I've taught you, give me my fee. Ekalavya delighted said, command me, my guru. There is nothing I will not give my guru. Drona replied, give me your right thumb. When Ekalavya heard this terrible speech from Drona, he kept his promise. His face showed his joy in it, and his mind was entirely resolved to do it. He cut off his thumb and gave it to Drona. And after that, when Ekalavya shot an arrow, his fingers were not so quick as before. Arjuna was greatly relieved. <coughs> now, this is a brutal story, even for the Mahabharata, which is all about the brutality of war. How are we to understand it? The tribals here are low caste people who seem to embrace Hindu dharma and Hindu forms of worship that makes the image of the guru and vows to it. But for such a person to stand beside the princes in archery was unthinkable. That is what the teacher realizes. And so in order to protect Dharma and also to protect the reputation of his own world-class archery student, Roman claims his retroactive tuition. Of course we are shocked. But where is the author's sympathy? It's very hard to be sure. Uh, author intentions one of those post-colonial, uh, post-modern things we're not supposed to talk about anymore. Anyway, I do. It's uppity of the club, you know, pushing where he does not belong. He cannot be an archer. He's born into the wrong family for archery. But he doesn't act uppity. His outward appearance invokes all the conventional tropes for low caste people. He is made of the wrong stuff. He is literally dirt. But his inner soul, reflected in his behavior, <coughs> is pious and respectful. He does what the teacher tells him to do. Not only is he a brilliant archer, but he is honest and humble. To this extent, at least, the Mahabharata likes him and presumably pities him. It refers to the teacher's command as terrible, Dharma. Yet the act 
I would take a lot of your proof, says metal as an archer is one of the gratuitous and grotesque cruelty to a dog. The animal that is in many ways the counterpart, even the totem of the tribe. The dog barks at him, betraying the class attitude that dogs often pick up from their masters. The dog doesn't like the way Eglavia looks, probably doesn't like the way he smells. Does Ekalavia's unsympathetic treatment of this dog cancel out our sympathy for Ekalavia as the victim of interhuman violence? Does it justify the teacher's cruel treatment of him when goes around, comes around? Or does it at least remind us of the cruelty inherent in the caste-specific dharma of a hunter? Hunters are cruel, they kill animals. The text, however, shows no sympathy for the dog and therefore no condemnation in the lobby on that front. I read the text as deeply conflicted. It assumes that this is the way things must be, but it doesn't like the way things must be. It paints a Columbia sympathetically despite itself. In the face of his defense of the caste system, the author of this story saw the humanity in a Columbia, saw that pariahs were human beings of dignity and honor. It doesn't necessarily mean that tribal people tried to break into the professions of the class of nobles and warriors. Nor does it mean that nobles went around cutting off the thumbs of tribal people. It means that the author of this text imagined the situation and was troubled by it. And the people who heard and eventually read the text <coughs> must have seen that too. Many, maybe some of them as a result, treated pariahs whom they encountered with the imagination of a better world may have made it a better world. Moreover, during the long history of this story, for the story was retold over the centuries in India, different people did read the story differently. The Brahmin reading was not the only one, and therefore the later readings, I think, encourages us to allow ourselves to imagine in potentia, in bija, in seed form, more compassionate readings, the more liberal readings, you might say, embedded in the text, even though the text defends what the dawn, what the teacher did to cut off the, the thumb of a Columbia. There are several texts, there's no time to read um, all of them. I'll read one more and then the contemporary telling. There's a 16th century text told by giants, who are the people who really believed in compassion to animals in ancient India. And the text begins the same way um, as the Mahabharata, but then it branches off in a different direction. Arjuna, in the forest, sees that the mouth of his own dog is filled with arrows that had not pierced his upper lip, lower lip, palate, tongue, or teeth. So this text retells the story, and as if it heard me complaining, what did he do to the dog? It says, he didn't do anything to the dog. He shot the arrows in such a way that he did not injure the dog's mouth. When Arjuna said, thought, no one but me has such a power, he was amazed, and he found the tribal and said, who did this? And he said, I did this. And then he says, Arjuna says to the tribal person, you must do puja, you must honor the guru with the thumb of your right hand. So it's now the prince and not the teacher who tells the tribal, cut off your thumb. The tribal said yes and did it, but then the guru said, Arjuna, you are a sneaky, cheating city slicker, and you've deceived this artless, honest, unsophisticated forest dweller. But by my favor, even without a thumb, these people will be able to shoot arrows. And as he said this, the guru gave the tribal this favor and went back to his own place. And so even today, a tribal can shoot arrows using his middle finger and his forefinger without his thumb. So the text is obviously backpedaling, backpedaling in a number of ways, telling the story, but making a more serious moral accusation of the Hindus who would have cut off the tribal's thumb. Um, the Hindus then retold the story with reference to the giant retelling, and the story ends this way, the, this time the hunter cuts off his thumb, but the teacher thus destroyed his heart of archery by a pretext, but pleased the tribal hunter by offering him his own thumb ring in return.
return. He said, an art that has been imparted to an unworthy person might quickly lead to evil acts. And so the venerable teacher, who knows the result of compassion towards all beings, took back that art from him, and not out of hatred for him. So the Hindus recuperate the text from the giant and say the art itself would have suffered. It wasn't yet anything against the uh, tribal. He simply was protecting the art of arts. When he gives on his tribal, his, his thumb ring, which I think is small compensation for his uh, dubious compensation. So, in conclusion, then, I want to talk about the contemporary meanings. If you put all these stories, and there are many more, this was a much we told, and it, it was something that they kept working at, a much we told story. We can see other possible multiple readings of the story, even in the original text of the Mahabharata. It sends us back to the, to the root text. There's a two-way conversation going on between the Hindu and Jain texts, an intertextual conversation. The Jain text quotes the Hindu Mahabharata, an example of the widespread intertextuality between religions in India, not just within Hinduism. Jain texts, Buddhist texts, Hindu texts, and then the Islam texts. Muslim texts are constantly in conversation with one another. Hindus would also know the Jain version and the Buddhist version and the Muslim version as well as the Hindu version because it's a two-way street. The supposition justifiable on the basis of our understanding of the relationship between Hindus and Jains and indeed later on Muslims during this period. And this contributed to the eventual use of the story of Hekalavya by Dalits themselves by tribal people and low caste people who do not read Sanskrit. The story gets into the vernacular languages, ultimately into English retellings. Contemporary Dalits constitute approximately 16% of the population of India today. They are a very large group. And they do indeed use the story of Ekalavya for their own purposes. They want Ekalavya to do what the ancient myths do not reveal him doing. They want him to revolt. One poet says, I am conscious of my resolve, the worth of the blood of Ekalavya's finger. Another writes at greater length, If you had kept your thumb, history would have happened differently. But you gave your thumb, and history also became theirs. Ekalavya, since that day, they have not even given you a glance. Forgive me, Ekalavya. I won't be fooled now by their sweet words. My thumb will never be broken. And the final poem. Ekalavya, the round earth, a steel lever in my hand, but no leverage. Oh, Ekalavya, you ideal disciple, give me the finger you cut off. That will be my fulcrum. In the realm of social action, too, Ekalavya lives on. There are, there are Ekalavya education foundations in Ahmedabad and Hyderabad. The Ekalavya ashram in Adilabad, a northern district, or in Maharashtra, is a non-profit tribal welfare facility established in 1990. Run by people from the local business community, it serves underprivileged tribal people who cannot afford to educate their children. Poems such as the ones I read to you and organizations of this kind stand as a Dalit critique of Hinduism, rejecting both Ekalavya and, in some cases, Hinduism itself. The Lord's Cricket Ground in India has been renamed the Ekalavya Krita Mandal, the Ekalavya Games Circle. The ancient story lives on in a new and liberating form.
more in progress. Um, so, up to you. And a variety of other things. Thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, I mean, this is my opinion, and I, I, I would really like to, to hear your, your comments. Um, I, 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 I dare to think that Ecolavia was uh, suffered no injustice, actually. Because we know from the events that happened later in the epic that Arjuna was the fortress of the Pandoras. Mm -hmm. And they were. Um, they, they represented the power of good. And Ecolavia may have very well joined the Kauravas in the war. And, and that might have been detrimental for Arjuna and for the for, uh, victory of, of, of the forces of good. Mm -hmm. and, and, and next, we also know that Drona went, went to heaven. Mm -hmm. He died on the battlefield. And we also know that, that uh, in, the, in, in Hinduism, uh, devotion to Guru is of mm -hmm. utmost importance. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story of Ekalavya also could be read as a story of devotion yes. to one's spiritual master. Yes. And, and if, if, if one I mean if one is able to develop uh, such a devotion to one's spiritual master and to be able to sacrifice the, the, the most precious thing one has, then I mean he he's, he'll probably follow the uh, the steps of his guru in the afterworld as, as well. And, and, and that's what I think. And it's not really a story about injustice. Okay, the lower case is put down, but that's, that's like a normal thing in, in those times. I, I, can rem I remember that Ramachandra executed one shooter who was performing penance just for, for doing penance. What was that? Now, you're certainly right that in terms of the basic moral world, on the, on the Mambara, that this has to happen the way it, the way it happens. Um, just as in the earlier story I told, the dog is not supposed to go to heaven. It's, it, things happen the way they have to happen. The author of the Mambara is taking a, a conventional stance, which is in keeping with Hinduism as a whole. What I'm arguing is that when you read how stories develop later on, including the Ekalavya story, you realize that it's not just um, a, a rapid educated woman from New York who says, this is a bad story, that the tradition itself began to rethink the story. And the, the fact that they try to say he didn't hurt the dog, I left out the passage that, that you, uh, you can imagine where he, he worships the guru in all detail. He's a very, very devoted person and later texts are about how you do whatever the guru says and that and that's good. This is also, remember I said the real bhakti doesn't happen yet. It's going to happen in South India. But there are bhakti stories, the story of Kanaka, for instance, who tears out his eyes to give to the Shiva, the statue of Shiva, because he thinks that the Shiva statue is bleeding. And this is considered a very good thing to do. The physical self mutilation is considered a right way to prove what a good person you are. So the story is saying kind of that Ekalavya is a very good person and does the right thing, and that Arjuna is also within his right. The Mahabharata story is saying Arjuna is within his rights. But what I'm saying is that the story is written by a Brahmin, but it begins to have shadows in it, which lengthen as the centuries go on under the influence of conversations with Jainism, with Islam, and ultimately with Christianity. Indeed, by the time we get to contemporary Ekalavya, it's after on Bekar has moved the untouchables into Buddhism and all sorts of things have happened. And I'm saying that when you read the history back into the Mahabharata, which absolutely says what you said, this is good, why is it that the Mahabharata goes out of its way to tell you what a good person Ekalavya is and not what a good person Arjuna is? Arjuna is proud, he's jealous, he's envious. I'm saying the seeds are there that it doesn't come from nowhere. All of a sudden, centuries later, people say, gosh, you know, I think perhaps we should treat uh, untouchables better. That the seeds of a complex moral view which cannot yet be expressed are in the text. 
But I am indeed saying what you're saying, which is the text says it was right for Jonah to cut his, ask him to cut his thumb off. It was right for him to cut his thumb off. But he does say it's Dalla. It was a terrible thing to ask him to do. So I'm looking for just a place where I get my foot in the door for, the, for opening up a moral argument which we do know historically did develop there. So I agree with you, and I'm, I'm looking for the beginnings of something. Just with the dog, right? The, the text is not saying we should take dogs to heaven. It takes the, the 18th century temple of Bible in Benares to allow you to let a dog into a temple. Otherwise, dogs, other parts of India, dogs are stoned if they got them into a temple. But you can see the Mahabharata is playing with the idea, which, I'll give you another example. Um, later in Mahabharata, Yudhishthira takes a visit to hell before he goes to heaven, and in hell he sees his brothers who are condemned to hell and who are suffering fire and brimstone and all this stuff in the hell. But you just was such a good person that the breeze from his body is a sweet smelling and cool breeze. And so his brothers and his uh, wife Robbie all say, stay here. You know, you, he's just on a brief visit. They say, don't go back. Stay here because we are, we, our pain is relieved uh, with this sweet um, cool breeze, we're not in such agony. And so Yudhishthira says, I'm going to stay here. And the God, same God, Yudhishthira says, you're not going to stay there, you go to heaven, there for hell, you're a good guy, you're supposed to go to heaven. And the Mabar is stuck because he's such a good guy, he wants to stay there, but he shouldn't. Abracadabra, there is no hell, it was just an illusion, it was yet another text from Yudhishthira, his brothers aren't in hell, he doesn't have to make this impossible decision. A thousand years later, in the Quranas, the posture goes to hell. He's a good guy. He's just visiting the same scene. People who aren't even his brothers, they're just people. They say, stay here, sweet breeze, same, same scenario. And he says, okay, he says, I will give you some of my good karma, and that will relieve you. And he does. And he doesn't lose his good karma, because karma at this period is something you can create infinitely. It's probably merit transfer. And so he goes to heaven, but they're also relieved. He can do a good deed. That idea of the transfer of karma is not yet available in the Mahabharata in 300. It only comes to Hinduism later on. So the later text gets Yudhishthira out of trouble, and that the Mahabharata can only get him out of trouble by saying, actually, it never happened. In a way, rewheeling the film and saying he never did really see his brothers in hell. And so I, I think you can see that earlier we see the Mahabharata saying, what are we going to do? We'd like to have him have infinite compassion, but Hinduism doesn't have that rule. You go to heaven, you go to heaven. And so I see these stories as, as um, presenting messy, unsolved problems that get tidied up later on when you have know, different moral problems. That's awesome. But don't I'm sorry, just, just a, a brief question. So, but do you think that uh, uh, a Hindu today would read the Ekalavya story more akin to the giant interpretation or would you stick to the, I mean, what, what we actually have in the text? Um, a lot of Hindus are very, very much against the way that their own religion has traditionally treated Aitachans. And such a Hindu, I think, would read the text my way. But we still have caste in India because a lot of people think it's a perfectly good system. They would be the Mahabharata people all the time. So I think, I think it's a morally open question. It depends on this on, on the ethical stance you bring to it. It's it's a it's a great text, which means it's a morally ambivalent text. Uh.
put one on the other? Or do you say it's fully vocal? Is it fully also? I, I didn't really get that. And I also I don't know enough about yeah. the about the soul. Yeah, I mean, yeah. just add one thing yeah. because yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's very much the same question. Yeah. question. I mean, with, with, with regard to dogs, I mean, in the story of Rudisha, would it be fair to assume uh, that uh, that particular uh, agent of transgression, as it were, was in fact depicted as a dog in order to make the attempt not successful and pre That's an interesting idea. That's an interesting idea. Well, let me answer the question first, which in a way answers yours. Um, first of all, you, you have to accept my premise, which is that animals sometimes represent themselves, but very often symbolize humans. And that argument is based upon the great fable tradition of India, where you get the jackal and the lion, and the lion is the king, uh, and so forth. So, so there, are, there are reasons to believe that Hindus in this period did, in fact, use animals symbolically, as well as telling stories about animals. And I think that story about the dog that wanted to be a tiger I've never seen a dog that wanted to be a tiger. I mean, it's not a thing that dogs do. Dogs steal meat. Dogs chase cats. Dogs don't so, so it doesn't make sense as a dog story that Lassie finds her way home over the mountains of Scotland. I mean, they're the, the loyal dog and so forth. This is not a dog story. The dog that wants to become a tiger has no reference in any observation of animal behavior. Therefore, I think it's a symbolic story. So I think there are grounds to think that animals in general in India often symbolize, although there are also stories about dogs as well. Um, the reason why dogs are regarded as unclean by many religions, but particularly by those religions which, of which the two extremes are Hinduism and Judaism, which are alike in many ways, and Islam, the Abrahamic religions, but not even the Semitic, not, not Christianity, Judaism, um, it's because these are religions which put enormous emphasis upon the purity of what you eat and have very strict rules. Uh, Hinduism and Judaism, I don't know about Islam, you may correct me on this, are the only religions I know of which have strict rules not only about what you eat, but about the purification of the vessels that you eat out of so that a plate that has been used for certain things cannot be used again. I mean, most people say you can't eat this, you can't eat that, there are vegetarians and so forth. But Hinduism and uh, Judaism and Islam are very, very particular about food. Dogs eat feces. Dogs eat carrion. Dogs eat anything whatsoever. And indeed, I've been just taking across the history of animals. Um, the hypothesis that Stephen Budiansky has set forth, which I think is very good one, about how dogs became domesticated, that is to say how wolves turned into dogs, was that those wolves who were willing to suppress their natural fear of human beings in order to eat the garbage became dogs. That dogs were attracted to human beings because they would eat the leaves. So almost by definition as a species, dogs are the animals that eat unclean things. And therefore, they're the symbol of uncleanness for religions like Hinduism and Judaism that put such emphasis on the purity of food. So I think that's, that's why dogs often play this role, even a dog. And you get in English, I wouldn't even give a dog that I wouldn't. This is a night I wouldn't even turn a dog out. They become um, symbolic in, in linguistic tropes and in, um, in sayings of the lowest of the lowest. I would not even do this to a dog. They, they take on that character. So that if you say even a dog could go to heaven, then that really is where you're saying anybody can go to heaven. Now, the question about the sea text is a, is a good one. It's a complicated one. Um, stories are told before they're written down. Um, in India in particular, stories are told for a long time before they're written down. <coughs> in India, the only language which had scribes was Sanskrit. Anyone who knew Sanskrit was a literate person. It was a literary language. It was a written language. You never just used Sanskrit to say, pass the word, you know, move over, get out of my way. 
anyone who knew Sanskrit had a normal <coughs> language in which he or occasionally she, mostly men, but some men, will we gender out of the argument that it was just a text to, let's just say, um, um, had another language. So the stories were being told in all sorts of languages, but by the time the Brahmin spy wrote them down, he wrote them down in Sanskrit. So in that sense, the moment at which the story first comes to us is in the Mahabharata, is in Sanskrit. But probably there were other versions circling. The Mahabharata then gets retold in vernaculars. And then you get retellings in Tamil and in Punjabi and so forth. So the, the Mahabharata is the sea text only in the sense that the first fixed version to which we have access is in Sanskrit. But there are parallel versions and probably earlier versions too that eventually pop up in Tamil and Tamil gets written down much later and so forth. So it's only the seed in the manuscript sense. It's not really the seed intellectually. But it's the earliest text that we can actually date. We can't date any Bengali text earlier. I don't know the history of Bengali. I guess ninth or tenth century is about as early. We have a thousand years of Sanskrit before you do anything else. So in that sense, we have to say it's where we begin. Because our textual knowledge begins in Mahabharata. But everybody knows that the Mahabharata existed for hundreds of years before it got into Sanskrit. And who knows if some of those variants are not the ones that eventually appear in the 18th century in Kashmir or something like that. It's only a manuscript tradition of the U.S. So it's a, it's a tricky. As for being polyvocal, it is indeed polyvocal in many ways. Uh, it puts together different um, linguistic traditions, different vernacular traditions. The Mahabharata was probably originally recited by wandering bards. Um, during the, to the camp followers during the great battles when there were seasons when you couldn't fight during the monsoon and, and the armies were at rest and so forth. It was then recited in um, the intervals between great sacrifices. Then royal sages used to say it at the, at the courts. And then you got people who just wandered around India and recited in villages. By this time it was more of a sense of the villages. So there's all sorts of ways that this great uh, body of stories uh, transmitted in and out of vernaculars back and forth, uh, written oral, oral written, and so forth. So, so um, the, there is an edition which was made in Pune in the 1950s, which is called the Critical Edition, which is just a bad joke. You can't do a critical edition on the Mahabharata. It simply places a few of the manuscript traditions. But all of us who work with the Mahabharata and other editions, because it's not just leave stuff out. All stuff, all really important stuff is like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, I want to ask a, a question coming from kind of the, the broader religious studies perspective because my expertise is not in the area of, uh, of the Mahabharata or the Hindu tradition. Um, and specifically about the, the kind of the broader uh, context of uh, the the di kind of the dialectic of transgression and resistance that you're dealing with uh, and, uh, and engaging with in, in reinterpreting these stories uh, about dogs and, and what they what they mean and what they symbolize. Uh, kind of transgression and resistance versus authority and hegemonical control. And uh, so it calls to mind uh, uh, Walter Benjamin and Theodore Donner and kind of the, the uh, theoretical work that they did on on kind of critiquing um, counter-cultural movements. Yes. Uh, I am also Max Horkheimer and the others working in the Crawford School. Um, and, uh, and specifically I'm thinking of their critique of uh, Henri Bergson's concept of laughter, uh, which they critique as kind of a, a hyper-essentialized concept because Bergson describes laughter as the essential tool of those living on the underside of up, uh, upsetting and, and overturning uh, the Bob Teen gets into this fight at that point also. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and for Dono and Benjamin, Benjamin uh, artic articulates the first one, and Dono takes it over into negative dialectics, saying that it's a, a hyper essentialized critique, and essentially, uh, in the end, laughter is equally available to those in authority as it is available to those uh, on the other side. And so, practical joking works in both ways. Mm -hmm. So, 
uh, what, what this brings to mind is kind of a broader, um, <coughs> broader debate about uh, approaches to religious materials, narrative materials in general. <coughs> uh, the point being, kind of how do we, it's something I struggle with in my own work, is how do we get out of the feedback loop of authority on one side, uh, resistance on the other, one contributes to the other, contributes to the other, and then there's kind of no way out of this feedback loop. Um, Why do you want to get out of that loop? It's a good loop. <laughs> okay, that's one, that's one response. So I guess I kind of wanted this to, to see kind of what, yeah, is there a solution if there's no solution? No, I think you have something which is, which is interesting, which uh, God knows happens in, 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 in various ways. Um, one way that it happens is in alternative literary traditions, so that you get, for instance, folk traditions recorded much later than this, of course, in which the Brahmins are mocked throughout, the Brahmins are fat and greedy and so forth. The chaste ascetics are really having on a side all the time, they just pretend to be yogis and so forth. So you get counterculture traditions in other languages. That's not so surprising, it's a lot of fun to, to read those stories. What is interesting is that you get within the Sanskrit texts themselves, the Mahabharata. Um, I, I just came here uh, uh, from Berlin, I was in Paris, and in Paris, I presented a, a paper on uh, a whole, Mahabharata's 18 books. One whole book, book four of the Mahabharata, is in its broadest outlines a satire on the Bhagavad Gita that occurs in book six. So the first thing to say is that the Mahabharata satirizes itself in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, the incarnate god Krishna preaches a sermon to Arjuna on the eve of the battle. In the Virata Parvar, Arjuna in hilarious drag with his muscles sticking out of his sari and all sorts of jokes about how he looks like a guy and he's dressed as a girl. And it's just a whole carnival scene. Um, preaches to the prince, Uttara, who's a scared adolescent kid. And it's all just, a, it's a cake on the Gita. Not only that, it occurs before the Gita occurs in the Mahabharata, which means that you have to know the Gita book six when you're laughing at the joke in book four, which means that the whole text has to be in the head of the audience because the Mahabharata is a deeply infused text. And my colleague Ramanujan in Chicago used to say, no, we do ever use the Mahabharata for the first time. So you're dealing with a culture which knows its stories, these, these illiterate quote unquote people who know the whole Mahabharata, so when you're telling it to them, they already know it. So they can laugh at it because it's their own tradition, they've internalized it, and they've internalized the jokes as well. So the satire, the resistance, the countercultural aspect of the Mahabharata is actually present in the Mahabharata itself, partly because it keeps bringing in things from the outside, and partly because it's such an enormous text that people internalize it in different ways. So the you have real resistances. So you get, for instance, the poems of Tukaram, which are often obscene, and, and, and you get Bengali. Um, hymns to the god would say, you know that time you killed that demon? Well, I bet you were smoking dope at the time. You were always stoned out of your mind, and that's the way you could even have the courage to go into battle against the demon. And they say these terrible things to the god. So, and it's still okay. It's still pious. These are really Hindus. These are people who really believe in Jesus. It's just one of the things you're allowed to do in certain of the traditions. Um, so that the laughter and the resistance is uh, um, I just did a wonderful dissertation on Mahabharata. She called it a contested text. The text itself is arguing with its own premises, and even without laughter, um, <coughs> there is a serious ongoing critique of the warrior ethic. So you have the sort of as you have in the Iliad too, of course. You have the sort of it is noble to fight well, warriors better to die in battle than to die in bed, and they really mean it and they say it. And then there are, there's a guy, often in this case it's even the incarnate God, who says, let's kill these guys and they're asleep while they're asleep, then we won't get hurt. And people say, hey, you know, that's not how warriors are supposed to behave. And Krishna says, that's the only way you're going to win, take it or leave it. So they say, okay, and they do it. So there's a satire.
satire, or a bit of satire on the warrior ethic, along with true people saying we must do the right thing, and never hit a man in the and all that sort of thing. Um, the text itself had that richness in it, and the, the broader Hindu tradition has that richness in it. Um, Aziz, in introducing me, mentioned I'm getting a little bit of trouble from some of the um, uh, Hindu organizations because the book, I wrote a long book on the other pages, bringing out these resistant traditions in Hinduism, which have been suppressed since the 19th century by the dominant forms of Hinduism under the British Raj, which, which have emphasized Vivekananda and the Gita and the philosophical traditions. And I sort of re-evoked the satirical and, and in some cases, not so much obscene as sort of um, earthy uh, traditions, which are not known to a, a lot of Hindus today, and which are not regarded as acceptable anymore, sanitized, and so forth. But it started, that, that's what's great about the tradition. It has its inbuilt critique right along the way, even in the Sanskrit texts, and certainly in the vernacular texts, once we get them reported. Um, and, and laughter is part of it. So yes, there's a loop. And you can't get out of it because you need to know the serious facts in order to make the jokes, and you need to know the jokes in order to realize that the high ideals are fragile, are vulnerable. The Mahabharata says Dharma is sukshma, Dharma is subtle, it's like a very fine silk. Um, if you say you should never kill animals, everybody knows you should never kill. What if you're starving? Well, if you're starving, you should kill animals, of course. And, uh, every rule has a counter rule. Every noble ideal has a satire right beside it. Um, and I love that. That's what I love. That's what I love. Uh, um, I actually have the same uh, uncomfortable position to the resistance uh, authority issues in the loop. So I'm, I, I will start with two, two points that you made, and I'm reformulating them somehow. You, you should tell me if I'm taking them wrong. One is this idea that at some point the Brahmin decides to write the story in a different way, or to like that. What 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 um, you see in a story is a moral dilemma. So I, I like this image of the of the Brahmin's moral dilemma, mm -hmm. which is much more than resistance and authority. Yes, in this issue, it's much more. Mm -hmm. So now then, if you look at, at this idea and these individuals who you don't know, you don't recognize. But we'll try to continue to rewrite the stories. What you have actually as a process in what you describe us is basically, I uh, call it, I'm not the original, an imaginative exploration of possible moral horizons. Mm -hmm. So people, in fact, use these stories to create possible moral worlds mm -hmm. and express them. And that's where you see these dynamics. Now, um, that's a very good reformulation of what I was trying to say. What, what is nice about it is, is I think that it, it, it follows exactly the process in which some moral norms become crystallized at certain times. Exactly as you tell us that what the dog used to be some years ago, now it became in fact a contested moral norm. No? So you have a relation between the stories and the social processes going on there. Um, and, and this was the first, the first point, and I think there is, there is very nice, in fact, um, connecting it to something really different, psychological literature on children's moral reasoning, mm -hmm. which goes exactly in the same direction, so the way they learn moral reasoning through this kind of imaginative um, what if pushing, this, what if that, exactly, what if this? pushing of the limits. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not something that comes out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to make this connection, the second one, which basically grasped the gist of this explanation, is something you said at some point, which is accidental grace. I really like, I think that we should write histories or anthropologies of accidental places mm -hmm. because this is exactly what is happening. You have moral norms and then you have the idea of an accidental place which turns it completely upside down or creates this moral dilemma. Right. And we, uh, this is not something that belongs to Hinduism or any, uh, this belongs to any kind of religion, in fact, the idea of accidental places. Well, um, yes, I'm glad you said that. Accidental grace in several different forms in Hinduism. And again, it's contested. There are people who don't like it. Um, it accidental grace is not just, right? This guy has been a uh, son of his all his life. He shouldn't go to heaven. I've been good. I follow the rules. I should go to heaven. 
you should go ahead. So you can get that, that argument. Um, you can get an argument uh, between two different theologies in South India about, again, animals, symbolic animals, cats and monkeys. And they tend to lie about the lie. The, um, the cat school, the monkey school, let's start with the monkey school. The monkey school says God is like a female monkey. Um, she carries her babies and she goes from branch to branch and she uses her paws to do that. So the babies are going to hang on themselves when they, when they move around, otherwise they'll fall and die. And that's what God is like. We must work very hard to be good people and to follow the rules and to do whatever God wants us to do. But other people say, no, no, God is like a mother cat. She just picks up the kittens by the square of the neck and indeed if they try to help, they get in her way. They really should just go limp. And so we simply have to wait for God to come and pick us up. So these were the crystallized extreme forms of two branches of a particular South Indian school. But you still have, in Hinduism on the broadest level, to this day, um, those people who work very hard all the time to do the right thing, to do the pujas, to eat the right foods, to do what, what the, they have a, an enormously um, prescriptive and restricting code of, of, of behavior. But accidental grace was came in, in in the medieval period to demonstrate in this bhakti period when, when all you needed, like the people said, all you need is love, basically. Um, where if you really love God with all your heart and God loves you back, whether God is Durga or Krishna or Shiva, that's all you really need. And you can love God without even knowing it. So you have one school of the Vesha Bhakti where Kamsa goes to heaven when he dies because all his life he tried to kill Krishna. And he kept thinking, where am I going to find Krishna? I've got to get him, I've got to kill him, I've got to kill him. And he kept thinking of Krishna and because he always thought of Krishna, he went to heaven. Doesn't matter that he thought of him in a bad way. And then you get this idea of a thief who was terrible, who did everything, killed people, and slept with untouchable women, whatever the casting you think she shouldn't do, and he decided he needed money to pay his drug dealer or something like that, so he went to a Shiva temple to rob the temple, and he did rob the temple, and in the course of robbing, he couldn't find all the money he wanted, so he lit a candle to find his way. He lit a candle to Shiva, when he dies, he goes to heaven. He doesn't reform as a result of that, he goes on doing drugs and doing whatever he did all his life. So the accidental uh, grace was developed in extreme forms um, <coughs> to prove the power of the love of God. And there was resistance against it from past Hindus who said, no, heaven is, is a, a world of limited good, a zero-sum game. And indeed, karma is if, if I hurt you, then you get my good karma and I get your bad karma. It's just a mountain keep pushing back and forth. And we can't have all these people going to heaven because heaven is enclosed. It's called Torah as an egg in the Brahmana. And then you simply change cosmology. You get later text, you say, who said heaven was an egg? God's heaven is an infinite place. The good guys can go to heaven and the bad guys can go to heaven. They simply rewrote that cosmology to incorporate a different set of moral ideas about, about grace. And some people accepted it, and some people resisted it because it, it makes nonsense of, of, of the rules of justice that most Hindus don't really um, go by. That there is karma, but sooner or later you make a mistake, you will be punished for it, and so forth. So you have these different systems working on different kind of hydraulics almost, uh, side by side in India, and we still have them, you know, these different kinds of groups of people. But the idea of accidental grace is a, is a wonderful idea which comes into a lot of these texts and uh, is a challenge, among other things, to the caste system. Because God's grace will, 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 will save people who violate the rules of caste. And the reason that untouchables are low is because they touch cattle and they work with leather and they, they eat things that they shouldn't eat and so forth. So if those rules, if those rules can be overruled, then just like anybody else, and of course, untouchability is still very powerful in India. So not everyone bought it, but, but there are a lot of stories of this kind of eye problem. Right, now, I think, um, uh, first of all, let me announce that you're all, all uh, cordially invited to join 
gardens outside, or small reception in honor of Professor Monica. And join me in thanking her very, very much for her time to our day. Trying to figure out what. Oh, there we go. That's